Taco, want to come play? No thanks, Timmy. I'm really slammed with these work emails. And I've got an important meeting coming up next week with the office bigwigs. Aren't you glad kids don't prioritize the way we do? Relationships seem so much easier then. They came naturally. And somewhere along the way, we added pressure, pretense, and conflict to the mix. But every single one of us is still wired by God to be in relationships with others, whether through marriage or friendships. During this challenge, you'll discover how God wants us to connect and how we can help each other become all He wants us to be. Good morning, men. So we are going through the journey to biblical manhood, and we uh, are beginning challenge number three on relationships. And uh, before we get going, though, I want us to go ahead and do a shout out. And today's shout out is going to go to eight men that are joining us. They're doing the Bible study at the same time we are on Friday mornings. Uh, Pastor Greg Romeo at the Kingdom Family Church of Daytona. Uh, 51 miles from my house, uh, is the leader of the group. Uh, they're doing it on Friday mornings, like I said. They've been meeting now for about um, three years, but they've just started doing these, these Bible studies. And uh, Pastor, Pastor Greg has been very involved doing Man in the Mirror events and different resources over the last eight years. And so I wonder if you would join me in welcoming these men as they begin to join us with a video Bible study. Uh, the, uh, well, I didn't see a name of the group on there, but anyway, uh, the, the group that's meeting with Pastor Greg, would you help, uh, help join, uh, help welcome them? <laughs> One, two, three, hoo-ah! Welcome, men, we are uh, honored and glad to have you with us. So, uh, if you would, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to go ahead and put up the faith and life objectives for this challenge. You have cards on your tables. If you're online, you can download these. The Christian man is built for relationship. At the end of this leg of the journey, three objectives. I will understand that relationships give me the chance to love others as Christ loves me if, if married I will understand that my marriage is a gift from God that represents Christ's love for the church. That's for the head. For the heart, I will love others sacrificially. If married, I will make my wife after God my top priority. That's for the heart. And then for the hands, I will maintain moral and sexual integrity in my personal relationships. If married, I will pray with and for my wife. And so those are the things that we'll be uh, taking a look at from different angles here. Um, hey, you know, the, 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 how many of you are married? How many of you wish you were single? No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I was thinking about the difference between a girlfriend and a wife this, this week. And a, a, basically, the best part of a girlfriend is she'll still lie to you and tell you what she thinks you want to hear. You know, once you get married, that goes away. And so uh, there are all kinds of challenges, of course, in, in, in marriage. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Genesis 2.18 says it is not good for the man to be alone. Do you remember everything that God created was good? He created to man, and then he said it is not good for the man to be alone. We are made for relationships. So marriage is one of the principal or perhaps the principal way that God defeats the problem of isolation that men have. Or the positive way of saying it is giving a man uh, the companion that can be a, a life mate for him. And so I got married. And so I got married. I want us to begin uh, 
by saying that the title of the message is 68 words that can guarantee marriage success. For those of you who have been around here for a while, you might remember that 68 words sounds familiar. Well, that's the marriage prayer. The marriage prayer, God's plan for marriage success. So I got married. The problem is, you know, I wanted to have a great marriage, but I was clueless about how to pull that off. And so I got up, I went to work one day, and basically forgot to come home. Then, when my life began to come unraveled, we joined a Sunday school class. The teacher's name was Dan Stanley. And so I was there, basically I didn't know why I was there, but I thought I was there uh, to meet some sharp young guys who could be investors in my real estate deals. I mean, that's really why I was there, or at least why I thought I was there. So we were in one of those old-fashioned Sunday school rooms, terrazzo floor, those uh, chocolate milk-colored metal chairs, and we were in a circle, and I happened to be 180 from the teacher, Dan, uh, Mr. Stanley, and then uh, maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 young couples seated around in a circle. And I was sitting there, and I was, uh, I was really laid back in my chair. You know, I, I do this anyway, but I, I was doing it that day because I was arrogant and cocky. But I was, I was back like this, you know, and... <sighs> And I was staring at the floor, and the teacher was droning on about something. And I remember I was looking at a little spot on the, on the floor, going over my daily planner, and he read a verse of scripture that I actually heard. And it was like someone had hit me with a taser, like how many, 50,000 watts of... of a voltage, and my body turned. I, I felt myself instantly, within seconds, my body turned red hot. I began to sweat profusely. Within a matter of seconds, I could feel that, that my T-shirt was, was already soaking wet. I, I turned beet red with embarrassment and humiliation, and I just knew, I knew that somehow the class had found me out, they had told the teacher, and the teacher had implicated me publicly and embarrassed me in front of all these people, and I'm looking at this little spot, and I couldn't, I couldn't look up because I was so chagrined that all these people now knew what a horrible husband I was and they were all looking at me in disgust shaming me full of disdain hating my guts wishing that I would go die somewhere <laughs> and so of course the class had no idea what was going on and the teacher went on to speak about other things but it was the first time in my life that I had ever experienced what I have come to understand as the conviction of sin. The conviction of sin. And so I want to read with you together the text that the teacher read that I that day heard that led to me experiencing the conviction of sin, which eventually led to me becoming a Christian. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25 Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now this is a summary of what the Bible teaches about how to be a godly husband, how to have a godly marriage. In other sessions that we have taught over the years, I have gone much further into detail about what it means uh, to love your wife the way that Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah loved the church as its prophet, priest, and king. I'll give you later maybe a couple of resources if you're interested in going deeper in that. You can find it in the chapter on marriage and the man in the mirror, the same thing. I got a, got a big butt. 
gigantic, if I'm going to be blunt about it. And you know what? The funny thing is, I got several big butts. And, and, and before you before you discard me or, or wince at the disgusting notion of that, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that possibly you have at least one big butt as well. Yeah, you like that? Hurts a little, huh? Let me tell you something. Let me just tell you something, okay? Everybody we know has a big butt. And more often than not, it's the thing that actually gets in the way of us living a consistent life for Jesus. Yeah, I think you know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to expound a little bit, okay? See if you can recognize some of these butts. But I have to work more. But my favorite TV show is on. But my kids have practice. But I got to tweet something. But it's such a beautiful day. But I'm just not in the mood. But I deserve a break today. You see, everything kind of interferes with my life of, of just living an authentic life for God, okay? And more often than not, it always has something to do with some sort of butt, okay? Even the littlest of butt can distract me. It really can. The littlest butt can make me think, well, I'm not going to pray today. I'm not going to think about it today. I'm not going to deny myself. I'm not going to read the Bible, blah, blah, blah. Whatever God asks me to do, I seem to have a butt for it and get away, okay? And the most horrendously big butt of all time is the butt that gets in the way of me just hanging out with God and reading His Word. It's true. Think about it. All the times you're about to open that, and all of a sudden a big giant butt gets in the way. A butt much like one of these. But I got a farm bill, but I'm tired, but the game's over, but I read last Tuesday, but I gotta check Facebook, but I don't like Leviticus, but it's too hot in here, but I, I just don't like books, but I don't understand it, but it's boring, but what does that have to do with me in the 21st century? Those are some ugly butts, people. Let's just call them what they are, ugly, ugly butts. Okay, and there's a lot more to them, sad but true. Here's a list, although not exhaustive, of some of the most popular butts known to mankind. But I don't have enough money yet. But others will think that I'm a nerd if I carry the Bible. But they won't like me if I talk about Jesus. But I don't know if God will do what I ask. But I just can't get motivated. But I'm afraid. But I don't have all the answers. But the small group is the same night as Monday Night Football. But can I just let my life speak for itself? But I'm not happy. But that's not my gift. But that's the pastor's job. But I don't know how to pray. But I can't believe that. But I don't know where to start. But everybody else is having fun. Butts abound, friend. But, 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 but. Here a butt, there a butt, everywhere. A butt butt, okay? And, and, and the most overused butt of all time, but I just don't have enough time. Really? Oh, come on, we have a lot of butts. God has given us a real simple word, okay? If we learn it, and we share it, and we teach it, and we live by it, then see, God gets glorified, people benefit, and then we get blessed. That's why we do what we do. That's the why behind the butt, okay? And ultimately, that's the whole point I'm trying to make here, my fellow butt lovers, is if your butt is bigger than your why, then your butt's too big. Okay, it's time to, metaphorically speaking, snap into a Slim Jim. Okay, let's slap on some spiritual shape-ups and hit the road a little bit so we can just manage the butts a little bit. That's all we're trying to do. That's what we're talking about. Let's minimize the excuses. Let's shrink the butts. Shrink the butts. Say it with me. Shrink the butts. That's what we need to do. And you and I can do that together. We can conquer this. You and I can do it. We start today, okay? I know we can. Let's just do it. No ifs, ands, or... Yeah. I think you get it. About what it means uh, to love your wife the way that Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah loved the church as its prophet, priest, and king. I'll give you later maybe a couple of resources if you're interested in going deeper in that. You can find it in the chapter on marriage and the man in the mirror, the same thing. But what I want to do is today is I want to tell you that if we were to take Ephesians 5, 25, and amplify it. You know, the, you've heard like amplified Bibles and so forth. That's where you take part, uh, a phrase or something, and then embellish it, if you will, to make it uh, the meaning more full uh, and more robust and uh, more understandable. And so uh, that's exactly what the marriage prayer does. The marriage prayer takes uh, and, uh, and uh, makes practical application of Ephesians 5.25. So on your tables, you have marriage prayer cards. And I'd like each of you, if you don't mind, to pick one of these up. Uh, hold your hand up if you do not have one, and we'll make sure you get one. Anybody not have a copy of the marriage prayer card? Okay. And so um, the reason I want you to have this in your hand, because you're not going to be able to write down the big idea today. Because I have gone for a world record big idea today. The big idea, the title of the talk is 68 words that can guarantee marriage success. And guess how many words are in the big idea? 
68. There's the big idea. It's the marriage prayer. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's ever had a bigger, big idea than this. So, now, uh, how many of you have memorized the marriage prayer? Raise your hands if you've, married, if you've already memorized the marriage prayer. Raise your hands. Three, four. Okay. So, for those of you who have not previously memorized the marriage prayer, I am going to offer you $100 for the first person who does. So the first person who memorizes the marriage prayer who has not already memorized it, I'm going to give you $100. My money, personal money, ain't no widows and orphans money. This is my money. All right? Now, there's a caveat. There's a caveat. Because I'm going to give you $100 for memorizing the marriage prayer, and then you're going to offer this $100 to the next guy who is willing to memorize the marriage prayer. And over the next 50 years, I want to see this $100 bill go through hundreds and hundreds of men's hands. Of course, it'll only be worth $10 in today's money by then. All right? So, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that $100 challenge here at the end, but that's, that's where we're going with this thing, all right? Now, <clears throat> the marriage prayer says this, Father, I said to death to his part, I want to mean it. Help me to love you more than her and her more than anyone or anything else. Help me Bring her into your presence today. Make us one like you are three in one. I want to hear her, cherish her, and serve her so she would love you more and we can bring you glory. Now, I've had more fun in my own marriage with this than I can shake a stick at. It is, it is absolutely transformed, revolutionized my marriage. My marriage. Now, so belief determines behavior. How many times have you heard me say that? Belief determines behavior. So we behave based on what we believe. And so believing, believing that this is either what you do already believe or what you want to believe, that's a pretty good starting point. And then what you will find is you believe this or you begin to believe it more and more that you will see your behavior begin to conform to your belief. This is behaviors conform to beliefs. That's, you know, that's what uh, you've heard me say about Andrew Carnegie here before. Uh, the older I get, the less I listen to what people say. I just watch what they do. That's because uh, what they do, their behavior reflects what they actually believe, who they really are and what they think. And so well, I watched as this prayer transformed my beliefs. And I knew it was transforming my, what I believed about my wife because I saw it working out in my behavior. Silly examples. Big examples, but silly examples. Like, for example, we have <clears throat> one of those trash cans. I'm not sure. It sits like in a cradle, and, and then you push the drawer in, and then it looks, looks like it's not there, and then you pull the drawer out, and there's the trash can. That's pretty cool. Well, it has a little plastic bin that you have to pull out. And uh, we put, you know, a plastic liner or a paper bag in there, uh, you know, inside the, the garbage pail, if you will. And so then when I make coffee, I use Splenda. Well, I used to use Splenda. Uh, I use honey now. Uh, one of our guys got me on honey. I love it. And, but the Splenda packets... You know, you take them, you, you, you tear them open, you put it in the coffee mug, and then you throw it in the trash can. Well, you know, my aim is not always that good. And so sometimes it goes into the garbage bag, but sometimes it would slide between the garbage bag and the plastic pail. You know, go down in that little area around there. And I wouldn't think a thing of it because I'm married and that's what women do. <laughs> All right? So um, a meaningful division of labor. I take care of the outside. She takes care of the inside. That's her job. I don't go, I don't go after that. Well, guess what? I started, I started this praying this, you know. I want to hear her cherish her and serve her so she would love you more and we could bring you glory. And so one day, just one day, out of the blue, 
I open a Splenda packet, put it in the trash can, the little tiniest piece slips over in between the plastic bag and the vinyl of the trash container. Next thing I know, I'm digging out the whole trash bag and, and bending over and putting my hand into that, you know, all the juice, you know, from the fruit juice and orange juice, that yucky stuff, and, and, and reaching down and getting that little thing and putting it in the brown paper bag and then putting the brown paper bag back into the vinyl trash container. I'm thinking to myself, what just happened? What just happened here? And I said, I've been transformed. I've been changed. And so if you want, if you want to, and we all, is there anyone here who doesn't want a great marriage? Whether you're married now or not now, is there anyone here who doesn't want a great marriage? Hey, it's not good to be alone. <laughs> We all want a great marriage. This is, back to what I said, this marriage, this is God's plans for marriage, for marriage success. So, pray this marriage prayer. And by the way, memorize it and I'll give you a hundred bucks. Be the first one to do it and I'll give you a hundred dollars. Now I'm going to talk about three reasons that, that I'm not divorced. And, uh, and, and first and foremost, is that I realized that my wife and I are really the only two people who are in this thing together. Have you realized that yet? Do you know that yet? Hopefully you do, but uh, it seems so obvious now, but it did not seem so obvious at the time. It seemed like that I had lots of people that I was in this deal together until that fateful day when I had such a problem, such an overwhelming problem, when I asked my closest friends to pray for me about this problem, and uh, after 10 days, none of them had bothered to check in with me to see how this crushing, potentially devastating problem had worked out. So I called them, and I said, hey, I know you're really concerned about me. Oh, yeah, I've been meaning to call you. I've been meaning to call you. Man, if you have not yet figured it out, you and your wife are absolutely the only two people who are really in this thing together. Everyone else, everyone else, everyone else is going to face in and out of your life. And as I like to say, even your children, hopefully. <laughs> so the first reason I'm not divorced is, is, is I, I figured out that my wife and I really are the only two people in this together. Second, oh, and, and as a result of that, I made her my top prior, priority after God, but before all others. Hello, I'm Pat Morley, founder and co-CEO at Man in the Mirror. And I'm David Delk, president and co-CEO. As you probably know, we have a devastating men problem in America. There are men all over this country who are confused, isolated, lonely, afraid, and caught up in destructive behaviors. They don't feel like their lives matter. They don't feel like they have a purpose and they lack direction. These men have exchanged the truth of God for a lie and the glory of God for an idol or idols. 72 million men in America make no profession of faith in Jesus. And it shows in our culture and of those who do profess faith, only a fraction are actually living biblically faithful lives as disciples of Jesus. In addition to the men problem, America also has a church problem. While every church wants to see men discipled, many churches are pulled in too many directions and don't have the resources to focus on discipling their men. Churches typically don't have the, the manpower or the expertise to intentionally meet men right where they are and help them grow in Jesus Christ. At Man in the Mirror, our vision is to help every church disciple every man. 
Since 1991, we've helped more than 35,000 churches impact over 12 million men. And we've learned from thousands of churches the key principles that need to be implemented in order to build sustainable and effective discipleship ministries with men. We know that these ideas work. In a 2010 survey, we found that churches that have implemented our model called No Man Left Behind see an increase in the number of men attending their church by 48% in just two and a half years. And they also see an 84% increase in the number of men involved in discipleship. How is that even possible? We couldn't believe these results at first ourselves, so we had them verified by a PhD who confirmed the findings. When we saw these results, we realized that God had given us a trust. And 1 Corinthians 4.2 says that he who's been given a trust must prove faithful. So we began to ask the question, what does faithful look like? We came to the conclusion that the thing churches needed the most were trained experts in their local communities who could walk alongside them to help them implement an intentional and sustainable strategy to disciple all their men. So we launched a field staff initiative that has trained and equipped more than 90 men from all over the country. These men are now helping churches create an environment where the Holy Spirit inspires men to engage in life and life discipleship. And uh, after only two and a half years, the results are very encouraging. In a recent survey, churches told us they're discipling an average of 15 new men after engaging with one of our field staff. 97% said they would be quite likely or extremely likely to recommend our field staff to another church. God is moving in the lives of churches and men, and we are praying for a revival that shakes our nation and the world for the glory of God. Amen. So if you have a passion to see men become disciples, please pray about joining us in this vital initiative. Men who complete the application and interview process will be offered the opportunity to become field representatives of Man in the Mirror. We'll train and equip you to start working as a volunteer with a handful of churches every year right away. You may feel called to move from this part-time role into pursuing a career as an area director. With additional training, our area directors are commissioned to work with an assigned territory of about a thousand churches. There are full-time, part-time, and volunteer positions available as area directors. Both the field representatives and area directors are trained experts in men's discipleship and provide local churches with encouragement, coaching, and concrete help to actually disciple men. We've been blessed. God has supernaturally assembled a team of godly, gifted men and women who love Jesus and each other and are passionately and urgently committed to solving the men problem. No matter how our nation got into the current situation, the only solution is to disciple our way out. We cannot, we must not, and by God's grace, we will not fail. This is your invitation to join us in the battle for men's souls. Click on Take the Next Step and get started today. Thank you. Thank you. You hear this one a lot. Science has proven evolution, therefore evolution is true. Since evolution is true and Christians don't believe it, then Christians don't believe science and they aren't rational people. Really, let's put that claim to the test. First off, evolution in the sense that things change is evident. No rational person disputes that. Therefore, rational Christians believe it. We can observe change, but evolution in the sense that life came from non-life and then that life began to randomly generate new genetic information and over time it eventually produced humans is something entirely different and something that quite honestly doesn't hold up against science. In other words, evolution in the sense of molecules to man is not scientifically plausible and therefore should not be viewed as scientific fact. Quite honestly, it is in great opposition to science, that is, observational science, the kind of science we can test and repeat and use our five senses to understand. Science demonstrates that over time, Living organisms lose genetic information. They don't gain it. That same science demonstrates that life doesn't arise from non-life. Hey, follow along if you would. Fact one, there is no known observable process by which new genetic information can be added to an organism's genetic code. 
None. That pretty much refutes evolution right away because there's no way to go from a fish to an amphibian without adding new information, right? If living organisms cannot produce new genetic information, how can anything gradually change into something of higher intelligence or form or complexity? That is, how can anything evolve from an amoeba to a man without adding new genetic information? The answer, of course, is that it can't, plain and simple. Now, some have speculated and they have imagined all kinds of things and they brought in artists to produce creative renderings based on guesses and they have been successful in telling a very convincing story that humans evolved from ape-like creatures. But those are just drawings, people. They're just stories. But what we really observe is humans are humans and apes are apes. Now, if fact one buried evolutionary thinking deep into the Precambrian soil, this next fact, fact two, tosses so much sediment on it that not even the greatest team of paleontologists with the latest subterranean gizmo could dig up the remains. Check this out. Never, again, never has it been observed that life can come from non-life. So here are two major scientific evidences against evolution. I reiterate for clarity, life has never been observed to come from non-life, and there is no known, observable process by which new genetic information can be added to the genetic code of an organism. So molecules demand evolution doesn't really make scientific sense. Yet we are all here, and life is all around us in various forms. Although evolution cannot account for this, the Bible can. The Bible reveals that the all-powerful, all-knowing, supernatural God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, and all life according to its kinds, that is, each with its own set of genetic information. So, again, what the Bible reveals makes sense of what we see and understand. Evolution does not. Enough said. Hopefully. <laughs> so the first reason I'm not divorced is, is, is I, I figured out that my wife and I really are the only two people in this together. Second, oh, and, and as a result of that, I made her my top prior, priority after God, but before all others. Second, I stopped trying to control my wife. Well, almost. No, I've, I have, I have, I've stopped trying to control my wife. So, <clears throat> it's interesting because I didn't have any mentoring or tutoring in this, or discipleship, uh, that I understood at least at the time, or maybe I just thought I was smarter than the people who were trying to disciple me. Oh, by the way, that is a bit of an issue sometimes, thinking you're so much smarter than the person who's trying to help you. And you may be smarter, but maybe not on that issue. And there are some other things that could be said another time about that. But I, I just am selfish. You know, I'm still selfish, but, but I wanted someone who would be basically my soulmate and my servant. Someone who would make my life easier and it's always just a, I was I think I'm even thinking as I'm talking right now I probably just need to confess that I was a controlling person you know now I was not a crass controller I was very refined controller <laughs> You know, I was diplomatic about it. Some, some guys are not very diplomatic about trying to control their wives, right? But I was very diplomatic and refined. And uh, so I began to, to encourage my wife to lose 20 pounds. <clears throat> and I encouraged her for several years in different ways, uh, always uplifting ways, uh, all the positive benefits of, to her, of her health, and all, to lose these 20 pounds. And, um, and so one day she says, you know, I just don't feel safe with you anymore. After 27 years of marriage, you know, I just don't feel safe with you anymore. And uh, so I'm a smart guy, right? So I see the problem. I'm going to fix it, turn it around, get this back on track, and a couple weeks from now, it'll be like it never happened before. Hmm, not so much. So, I did turn it around, 
And uh, I, I developed this, this idea that I, I don't know exactly when it got to the final form, but you've heard me say this perhaps before, uh, and this is, this, is this, this is the solution. This is the reason I'm not divorced, uh, you know, because I stopped trying to control her, and this is the idea that I use as my mm, governor, my whatever. <clears throat> I let you be you, and you let me be me. I let you be you, and you let me be me. And so I don't try to control her anymore. And so I started just applying this. Well, she's not responding. She's not responding. Doesn't she understand I'm changed? I'm a new man. I've been transformed. What's her problem? The problem is, is, is that I had so damaged her that it was not something that was an easy fix. And so it took uh, about three years, three years, one day I was sitting there and I started this deal of you know, rubbing her feet with some lotion. And, and uh, we're sitting there one day and I'm rubbing her feet with some lotion. And uh, out of the blue, she says, you know, I, I, I feel safe with you again. I just wanted you to know that. I feel safe. Three years. First reason I'm not divorced. <laughs> <laughs> you know, is that I realized that we're the only two people in together. The second reason is that I stopped trying to control her. And the third reason is I started praying with and for my wife. And the, the interesting thing about praying with and for my wife, you know, we've always prayed with each other. It's, you know, one or two minutes in the morning, you know, tops, but it just sets the day in motion. Uh, and then, uh, you know, hearing each other pray to our God gives us an insight into each other that we would otherwise probably never have, at least not that profound of an insight. And then the idea of praying for her, uh, and her praying for me too, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm much more diligent about praying this prayer, perhaps because I need to pray it more than she needs to pray for me. But this, this idea that I pray with and for my wife, and so what's the prayer that I pray? Well, it's the marriage prayer. It's the big idea today. Father, I said till death do us part. Now, I pray it a little differently than it's written up here. I say, Father, I said till death do us part. I mean it. I don't say I want to mean it because I, I, I don't have to say that anymore. And then <clears throat> I say, I love you more than her and her more than anyone or anything else. I don't say help me to love you more than her because I do love you more her, and her more than anyone else. So I've changed it up a little bit in my own mind. Help me to bring her into your presence. Help me to bring her into your presence. Ephesians 5.25. Help me to bring her into your presence. Make us one. Like you're three in one. That intimacy. That companionship. I want to hear her. I want to hear what she's saying. I want to cherish her. I want, I want her to know that she really is more important to me than anyone or anything else. I, I really do want her to see that I love her the way Christ loves his church. And then uh, to serve her. Yeah, I, I want to do, I want to pick up those little, so I actually want to, using this as a metaphor for every other little trivial thing I can do. I want to pick up every little spend a placket that I can see so that she will love God more and so that we can bring him glory. And then finally, so what about reversing past mistakes? So <clears throat> the best predictor of future success, it says, I heard a lot of people in, in my day and some of some have worked out great, some have been average, and some have been failures. The, the, but I have, a, I have come down after 45 years of, of, of hiring and sometimes, you know, even having to let people go, not very often, but um, I've come down to a single, a single overarching idea. And that is that the best predictor of future success is past success. And so when we're looking to bring someone on, we're basically looking for someone 
who has a pattern of success doing something, really anything, but a pattern of success over an extended period of time. Now, we're talking about marriage, and you're thinking, yeah, well, I don't have that pattern of success, and so of my future, if the best predictor of my future marriage success is my past marriage success, I may not be in very good shape, but I want to share an idea with you that struck me this week that I think could be revolutionary, and that is if you don't have your own marriage success, imitate someone else's. Find somebody who has been successful in marriage and ask them to adopt you, to mentor you, to disciple, to take you under their wing, to show you the ropes. How many, how many of you feel like you could actually help a young, another man by, by showing him the ropes because you have figured out marriage success? Raise your hands. Do it now. Raise your hands. Raise them up. Leave them up. Look at all these guys. <laughs> Look at all these guys who, who have, have figured out how to have marriage success. They're not saying they're perfect because they're not. I, I mean, I'm not. Nobody is. How many of you guys would like to have um, uh, a, a, some guy be your mentor to, to, to disciple you in the biblical marriage to, to help you towards marriage success? Raise your hands now. Raise them. Raise them up. So all the other guys are just happy being, being mediocre. <laughs> raise, raise your hands. Come on, do it. Take a chance. Do it. Be vulnerable. Be transparent. Raise your hands. All right, now, you guys at your tables, you have some mentors and you have some mentees. You guys get together, okay? You guys get together. I just, at, the, at all you table leaders today and online too, I'd like you to do the same thing specifically at your table. Ask, you know, who, who would like to have somebody spend a little time? You just get together one time. That's all you have to do. Just get together one time and just listen out. And then, you know, maybe you might get together again after that. Maybe not. But just, this is for one meeting. This is what I want you to do. Do this at your tables. Uh, Table leaders, ask, ask you guys, you know, who would like to have a little help? <clears throat> who would like to hear from somebody who's kind of been able to figure all this out? And then ask who it is that has it all figured out, and then get them together, all right? One time. That's it. That's it. People love to say the Bible is full of errors and contradictions, but the truth is most of them can be pretty easily resolved with a little common sense, honest investigation of the scripture, and the application of a simple method we're about to talk about. So, let's do this. Let's tackle the alleged errors issue. We'll do that by using a method I like to call a simple C. S. Spelling. That's right. Many of the so-called errors in the manuscript are simple variants in letters. Say you have one manuscript that was translated from Greek into Old English and another into American English. Well, the English okay, translators yeah. might write down theater with the R-E ending, and the American Howdy, team player. might write down theater with the E-R ending. Now, that's no error, my fellow thespians. It's a variant in spelling, so that's that for that one. On to the M. M is for mistranslation. This is when the original word might not have been translated to the new language perfectly or something along those lines. you got to realize that sometimes there's not a perfect word equivalent at the time of translations, or that the translator simply had a slip of the pen or used a word that perhaps could be translated in different ways. Context and comparison solves this lickety split. For instance, Leviticus 11, 13 through 19 says, and these you should regard as an abomination among birds. The eagle, the vulture, buzzard, and bat. Folks go nuts on this one. Bats aren't birds. Bats aren't birds. The Bible is wrong and can't be trusted. Come on. First of all, they didn't have the same animal classifications back then, and the original Hebrew word translated bird here is alf, or however you pronounce that. And although correctly translated bird in many places, it also has a broader meaning like having wings or winged creature, which would, of course, include bats. This is all settled pretty easily with a little looking and thinking, I'd say. Moving on to P for perspective. Sometimes the testimony of two people can seem contradictory, but when you pay close attention, it might not be that way at all. Quick example. Say there was a car parked in the middle of the street. There's a person on the right of the car and a person on the left. The person on the right says the car door is blue and there's a baby in the back, and the person on the other side says the car door is white and there are two babies. Now, oh, how can this be? These ferocious liars can't be trusted. Now, wait a second there, Jimmy Conclusion Jumper. Fact is, the car could be painted white on one side and blue on the other, and if there are two babies, then there is one, right? So both are actually illuminating the fullness of the scene. 
Remember, the guy on the right didn't say there was only one baby, he just mentioned one. You gotta pay attention to the language and perspective, people. Sometimes the whole truth is in the details, you follow? L. Literal versus figurative. It's pretty clear that the Bible contains different writing styles like poetry and narrative and uses different parts of speech like similes, metaphors, and analogies pretty much like we still do today. So if we really want to interpret correctly, it's our job to realize and understand the difference. How, you ask? Great question. By looking at the immediate context using our noggin and comparing it with the rest of Scripture. That way we understand when Jesus says in John 10, 7 that he is the door, he doesn't mean he's a wooden rectangle that swings on hinges. Need I say more? Finally, C for context. This is the biggie, folks. I'd say most alleged error issues arise when people don't acknowledge the proper context of the verse, they quote only part of it or purposefully misuse it. They might say John 3.16 says, For God so loved, but they say Deuteronomy 16.22 says, The Lord your God hates. Now which is it? Does he love or does he hate? Well, you know, this is silly, because the context of John 3.16 is about God's love for people, and the Dute verse is talking about his hate for pillars. You know, if you hack, twist, and misquote everything, you can pretty much make it say whatever you want, and that's not really searching for truth. So, there you have it. With a little effort, honest investigation, and application of the simple C method, the idea that the authority or inerrancy of the Bible is in any way diminished due to errors has been debunked. Adios. <clears throat> who would like to hear from somebody who's kind of been able to figure all this out and then ask who it is that has it all figured out and then get them together. All right. One time. That's it. That's it. Okay. Now we're going to do the questions, guys, and then we'll come back and have a little feedback. There are three questions, same format as always, reflection, knowledge, and application. So go ahead and take about uh, 20 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and talk about it. First time visitor, uh, we want to welcome you this morning. And uh, if you are here for the first time, would you raise your hand and let's just see here. Where else? Over here. <clears throat> All right, let's, let's welcome our first time visitors, guys. <clears throat> All right, you men yeah, here for the first time, I I'd love to have a chance to get to know you, greet you. And so if you come to this uh, card table in the front right hand corner, uh, have a chance to shake hands and, and talk a little bit. First timers up there, second timers, just stay where you are at your tables. Break. All right, and so what we're doing, we are just taking a few minutes just to see what kinds of some of answers, what, 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 what kinds of answers you came up with to some of these questions as a group. And so uh, if you would like to be a spokesman for some of the things that were said at your table or yourself, that'd be fine. So what one thing most attracts you to your wife or girlfriend and, uh, and why? <laughs> Your wife hears from God. She's spoken more red wow. into my life than any place else in my life. Oh, how about She's that? the finest person I've ever met in my life. Wow. Now let's get your camera on his face directly. <laughs> we'll send a copy of this to his wife. You're golden. You're golden, yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. Can you repeat him? I can't hear him. Yeah, so first of all, his wife hears from God. And speaks into his life, and she's the finest person that he's ever known. Good summary? Great. Hundred bucks. <laughs> All right. If you want to give him a hundred bucks, it's fine. Everybody in favor of him giving a hundred bucks? Raise your. <laughs> you know, you decide to do with what. I'll decide what to do with my hundred dollars, and you can decide what to do with your hundred dollars. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> Uh, anybody else? Andy? Yeah. Uh, we talked about companionship. Companionship. You know, companionship is so much stronger than anything else. Yeah. You can laugh with her. You can just hang out with her all day long. And yeah. when that is in place, uh, it makes a huge difference. Wow. So just the whole idea of being a companion. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, sex is great, right? But, I mean, sex actually makes up such a small part of a marriage. It's overwhelming. Um, yeah, it's still a good place. Uh, yeah, it's good. I understand. Yeah. 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 All right. Good. Okay, second question. So if Ephesians 
that's our marching order. So which phrase or idea in the marriage prayer most captured your attention today, and how's that reflected in, in our text of the day, Ephesians 5.25? Anyone? And gave himself for her. And gave himself for her. So amplify a little bit. That's the phrase that caught your attention. Yeah. All right, and gave himself for her. And how's that reflected in the marriage prayer? Well, I think if your wife believes you're willing to die for her, she won't have as much trouble yeah. submitting to you. All right. So uh, gave himself for her. It, it, that might relate to the phrase, for example, to, uh, you know, I want to hear her, cherish her, and serve her, for example. For example. So that's good. Excellent. Okay. Yep. John. Picking up on, on what you just said, because that was uh, <coughs> talked a lot about what service looks like. Often we think we're serving. What serving looks like. You thought about this and talked about that. It may not be what she perceives service mm -hmm. to be, so you may still be missing the mark. So understanding how to hear to serve mm -hmm. her is really important. Right? So understanding how to hear her and serve her, uh, because the way that, if I understand you correctly, the way that she wants to be served and the way that we try to serve uh, may not be lined up. It's good to make sure they're, they're lined up. I.e. the five love languages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, the five love languages, which we've taught here before, by the way. Yeah, that's good. If you don't have, if you haven't looked over those five love languages, you know, at least look at the table of contents. It's pretty intuitive. You can figure it out. And, uh, um, okay, anybody else? Yes, Jim. Till death do us part. Till death do us part. Okay. Because when when I looked at this, it's like <clears throat> as fellow believers, a lot of what comes after that, yeah. I could say to a lot of the men or other friends that I have, or Christian brothers or sisters, but I'm not sure that I could mean it with them to say till death do us part. Hmm. Hmm. All right, so he's just really, Jim is just focusing in on this till death do this part thing. And, uh, you know, if we, you, I have probably, uh, <clears throat> besides Jesus Christ, I probably taught more and written more on marriage than any other topic because you have your relationship with Jesus, you have your relationship with your wife, and then you go way, way down in the outline, your relationship with your kids, and then way down there underneath my feet somewhere is the relationship with everybody else, right? So uh, it is the singular most sublime and unusual relationship of, in all humanity. And, and so I've written three books on it. Uh, the Marriage Prayer, and, and which we're, we're looking at here, David Delk and I wrote. And, and incidentally, if you wanted uh, more information, uh, you can go to themarriageprayer.org, themarriageprayer.org. There's plenty of stuff there. And then Devotions for Couples. Uh, which 120 little two-page two chapters you can do together with your wife or by yourself, or she can do it without you too. And then um, Understanding Your Man in the Mirror, uh, which you can get at no cost. If you go to my website, uh, our website, you can get it at no cost. You can download that for free. And so, uh, and then Chapters in Man Alive with the 10 deposits that you can make in your wife's emotional bank account um, in the chapter uh, or two in the man in the mirror, where we unpack this prophet, priest, and king thing, and uh, uh, what, what a love and submit marriage looks like, and so forth. And uh, so, yeah, so I wanted to work those resources in somewhere in this uh, thing, and so you, you, you can check those out. All right, and, but uh, the, 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 the biggest thing that I've left out today, the one thing that didn't make it in today, that I, you can't say everything every time, would have been this commitment to the institution of marriage or to death to this part. That it's more important to be committed to the institution of marriage than it is to be committed to your wife. Not that it's not important to be committed to your wife, that's pretty important. But it's even more important to be committed to the institution because if you're not committed till death to this part, then what's the moral glue that holds you in place when you're just not getting along? Okay. Uh, anybody else on this one? Keith. We talked about help me bring her presence today, and if we're not in God's presence, then it does, we miss the mark. Uh, so we've got to learn to surrender first uh, and be in Christ so that we can bring her in. All right, so help me bring her into your presence today, but you can't do that if you're not there yourself, and so leading a, a surrendered life. Great. Last one. Uh, 
and supplying our needs. You know, God says, how supply your needs according to your rich, His riches in glory. Yeah. So if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more the Heavenly Father. But not just physical needs, but her emotional and spiritual needs. Mm. But really trying to seek out what she needs and, and take care of those huh. needs in earnest and love. All right, so as the husband, me and the conduit to meet uh, her needs because that helps fulfill the scripture that my God will supply all of your needs and often through the husband. Did, does that get the idea? Yes, sir. Okay, beautiful. That was very nice. Uh, try to remember that. Probably won't, but try to. Um, okay, so what are the past mistakes that you'd like to reverse? And uh, have you caught the vision for how the marriage prayer captures God's plan for marriage success and how it can help you reverse those past mistakes and are you willing to begin or continue to pray the marriage prayer on a regular basis? Okay, who, uh, who has something on this one? Okay, it is 8 o'clock, so uh, we're going to pray the marriage prayer together as we uh, close out today. And that will be uh, the big idea for the day. Let's say this together. Let's begin now. Father, I said, till death do us part. I want to mean it. Help me to love you more than her and her more than anyone or anything else. Help me bring her into your presence today. Make us one like you are three in one. I want to hear her, cherish her, and serve her so she would love you more and we can bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Have a great weekend, men. Hello, this is Tommy Beeland, pastor of The Church in Butler. Thank you for watching this Man in the Mirror Bible study series. My prayer is that you've been challenged to become the strong Christian that God desires each of us to be. If you've tuned in and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I would like to pray with you and for you. I can be reached at the church office at 478-862-5966. If you don't have a home church, we'd like to invite you to visit us at any of our weekly services. Please come and join us. We'd love to see you. For more Man in the Mirror Bible teachings, tune in each week to your local Flint Cable, Channel 14. Thank you, and may God bless you as you grow in Him.